Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke Wednesday at the 7th Eastern Economic Forum held in Russia's far east city of Vladivostok. With the theme, The Path to a Multipolar World, the forum kicked off on Monday with participants from more than 60 countries and regions attending. What were some of the highlights of President Putin's speech? To what extent can the Far East help reduce Russia's economic reliance on Europe? And what are challenges still ahead for the development of the region? To answer these questions, I'm glad to be joined today by Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, Mark Sloboda, Moscow-based International Affairs and a Security Analyst, and Robert Kelly, Professor from the Department of Political Science at Pusan National University. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Well, welcome to the discussion. Mark, I will start with you. Uh, it seems like uh, if you look at the theme of the forum, you know, the path to a multipolar world, it's crystal clear. I guess it is very different from previous forums. Um, well, I don't know if it's uh, completely different from other forums, but certainly there is an increased urgency in Russia's long focus and pivot on its um, eastern coast, on, on the Far East, as its most important vehicle towards economic development and trade with a Asia-Pacific region that is the most dynamic and important uh, economic sector of the global economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so Andy, this is a somewhat like uh, Russia's pivot to Asia strategy? Well, I think it is. And I would say that uh, this year's forum actually is radically different um, because, of course, the forum, the forum itself has not changed, but the environment in which it is taking place is radically different. Of course, the big difference is the conflict in Ukraine. But what this has triggered is a global realignment. And of course, I think this is within the context with which Russia's pivot to Asia, quote unquote, pivot to Asia is happening. And this is uh, also driven not just by the conflict in Ukraine, but secular forces as well. Uh, this is an important year because it also uh, represents the formal launch of RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, that represents about 30% of the world's population, 30% of global GDP. That's expected to grow to 50% of global GDP. So I think uh, this certainly is an enormous opportunity for Russia under very challenging circumstances currently. But still, I think it does represent a historic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Robert, uh, you know, uh, I mean, given this uh, ongoing Ukraine conflict, uh, you know, some people would say this is um, obviously uh, Russia efforts to, let's say, reduce reliance on the European countries. That's a major market for uh, Russian pro uh, products, you know, commodities, for example. Right. And then, you know, turn to Asia, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia or South Asia, you know, the, this uh, economic dynamism, I mean, as every, our other uh, major powers are also focusing on Asia. So it's both a short term and long term uh, strategy, let's say. Yeah, and I think it's smart for the Russians to do so, right? I mean, it's pretty clear that as long as Vladimir Putin stays president of Russia, even if the war ends, that normalization with the West is really sort of going to be pretty much impossible until Putin himself is out. Putin, unless these rumors that he's sick or something, turn out to be true. Putin will probably be in power for a while. His successor will probably be similar to him. So I would imagine that Russian Western relations are going to be in a freeze for a long time. So if you're the Russians, you need to find new markets, as your other guests mentioned as well. There's a lot of dynamism in Asia. The issue of sort of democracy as sort of like this kind of proof or sort of test in foreign policy just isn't as important out here, certainly not with, with China, which has sort of been behind you know, with sort of in Russia's camp on, on the conflict and, and other states in the global south have just not taken a side. So I think if you're the Russians, I think East Asia is a good place to go. I think in South Asia is a good place to go. And, and, and I, this is just a kind of continual, the continuation of the decoupling of the world economy, right, where the, the world economy is sort of separating to, uh, into sections. And I think that's been coming for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mark, uh, you know, President Putin uh, in a speech uh, made at a forum uh, you know, he said you know, to, to, the, to the meaning that then Russia had not lost anything in the global confrontation with the U.S. over the Ukraine conflict. Uh, 
uh, but had actually gained by setting a new sovereign course uh, that would restore its global uh, cloud. What do you make of his uh, such remarks? Well, of, of course, certainly in the short term, that is a little bit of undue triumphalism. Of course, there are costs. Uh, Europe has been a reliable energy consumer for uh, the Soviet Union and Russia for decades uh, leading up to February when the West began its existential economic war of sanctions and its control of the global and uh, financial uh, financial architecture that it has weaponized against Russia in an attempt to cut it out of its global markets. Now everything is changed, and there is indeed a great decoupling going forward. Uh, I think that in the, the medium to the long term, however, um, Russia's uh, changes its advantages in sovereignty. This increasingly forced pivot to the East will only be to Russia's advantage. I do not believe it is possible for many countries in the world to do normal business with a West that is desperately trying to hang on to hegemony and willing to sanction each and every country that violates what it sees as its God-given right to hegemony over the world. It's Russia is certainly the most sanctioned country in the world, but it is far from the only one. Countries from um, uh, China to um, uh, Venezuela to Iran to uh, Cuba. I mean, the list goes on and on. And this has obviously become the West's preferred weapon to try to hang on to their hegemony. Hegemony that is forcing a global split. Putin might like to see that as a path to a multipolar world, but I have to disagree. I think the world is actually being forced back into a bipolar world order because the West is forcing countries to take sides. Um, and if they're not willing to bandwagon and sacrifice their sovereignty uh, to the U.S. hegemon, then they're a target. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Andy, you know, of course, on one hand, there's a multipolar world or bipolar world. You know, countries are being forced to choose sides. And then there's the issue of like sanctions on Russia. Uh, from a Western point of view, you know, uh, are they working uh, or are they working as they expected? Well, I think certainly if you read Western media, um, they're working. But I think the reality is, is quite different. Um, and I think this also just shows that uh, many Western media outlets are really nothing more than loyal stenographers uh, for the United States in propagating, uh, you know, this myth that is showing some cracks. And I do think that uh, President Putin's statement is correct, um, that uh, countries like Russia are regaining uh, sovereignty, because one of the major issues here is not just the sanctions, uh, I think what some call sanction fever, uh, but also the shift uh, in currencies away from the dollar and the euro. I believe it was the uh, deputy economy mis minister, uh, Ilra, uh, Ilya uh, Tarosov, who uh, said at the forum that uh, uh, the use of the currencies of friendly countries uh, is going to increase dramatically. And uh, recently, uh, the UN ruble trade exceeded uh, the ruble dollar trade for the first time ever uh, on the Moscow exchange. So I think uh, certainly uh, without this stranglehold uh, that the U.S. has on the global financial system through the use of the dollar as well as the uh, global payment system, uh, we are certainly seeing uh, countries being freed from this chokehold. Uh, well, Andy, you know, a uh, Russian energy giant Gazprom uh, did say that it had signed a agreement with uh, to start switching payments from dollars to yuan and ruble uh, for gas supplies to China. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, you are seeing I mean, because of the Ukraine conflict, you are seeing at least uh, you know some of the customers, at least uh, for Russian energies, are using rubles and all their own currencies. Is that uh, a step away from? Uh, you know, dollar uh, dominance? Well, the, you know, the, what I think of is this is not necessarily decoupling, but recoupling or, re, or not deglobalization, but reglobalization in that 
we are, uh, before our very eyes, seeing the emergence of new trade patterns, investment patterns. One, of course, is between China and Russia. Um, but also with other countries as well. Uh, you know, we're seeing, I believe, Saudi Arabia is now considering not just accepting the dollar. Uh, there's enormous pressure building up for this. So uh, certainly it's exciting and interesting times, and I think would say historic times as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Robert, you know, uh, look, look at this, uh, you know, sanctions, you know, the results, the outcome, uh, or at least for now, the Russian economy uh, remains, I mean, let's say in the okay state while the European countries are struggling, you know, with energy prices, inflation. And also, you know, you are seeing probably China, India, uh, and other countries, they are using, say, ruble, accepting uh, the, the terms basically from Moscow uh, instead of using dollars, of course, because of the, the sanctions uh, to purchase either green or energy uh, products. Is that a concern for, from a Western point of view? Yeah, I think it is if it really sticks. I think of all the countries, though, outside of the dollar system, I suppose, if you want to call it that, if, they, if the, the most important country that would, would make a switch would be China, if the Chinese do it, right, if the Chinese fully permit the RMB to internationalize and be used as a source of liquidity in other countries, particularly as a reserve value in other countries, then that would be a major shift. I just don't know if the Chinese are there yet, in part because China's sitting on a huge pile of U.S. assets. So I'm actually not convinced. I mean, Russia's economy is actually pretty small at this point. It's going to shrink severely because of the sanctions. So I think the real key here, if we're looking at sort of alternatives to the dollar, the real key is China. It isn't India or Russia. They'll come along, I think, for the ride somewhat in part sort of, as your other guests have mentioned, sort of push back on this perception of dollar dominance and the rest of it. But it's really China that needs to sort of make the decision, doesn't want to continue in the dollar system, which has served it so well, or doesn't want to sort of break out and go on its own and be a real reserve currency, because that has real strictures, right? I mean, you have to sort of like really let the currency go and you have to allow foreigners to come in and operate and swap out your currency more or less at will, which is something that a lot of countries don't like to do. I see that here in South Korea, which is ostensibly a market economy, but the government intervenes all the time in the currency market. Right. So, you know, I, we could get there. And there's sort of been a lot of talk about this. I think a lot of countries outside the United States dislike the perception of dollar dominance. That goes all the way back to, you know, the French in the 70s. Um, but I mean, we were, I don't think we're really there yet. I think the war, the Ukraine war could push that if the United States and China get into a sustained Cold War, which I do think is going to happen. That will also drive this process. So it could turn out that we're in the beginning of that process. But I, I don't see it yet. But I mean, if, if China and Russia really do segment the way and become like their own block away from the West, then yes, I think also means some kind of financial independence will have to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, a new global order or in, in the making. We'll touch upon that a, a little bit later. Uh, but Mark here, uh, President Putin also said, you know, Russia and China have agreed on the price terms for the natural gas to be supplied via a pipeline that will be bringing gas from a Western uh, Siberia to China via Mongolia. So we are seeing more gas supply to China and also more use of uh, renminbi and also uh, rubles. Yeah, um, uh, up until uh, now and, and going forward uh, for a bit, um, Russia had separate um, energy fields, gas in particular, going towards the west and to the east. Um, and this made Russia uh, somewhat reliant on trade on both, uh, both sides. Uh, the initiatives, the pipeline initiatives that Russia and China are working on together now will allow China to tap into West Siberian fields that go to Europe so that Russia can now will in the near future be able to redirect the supplies of gas that had gone to Europe instead to Asia, which is a much more reliable uh, economic and political partner than the West is. So that will be a sea change uh, for Russia. Uh, the question is, um, you know, how much um, economic damage will Russia take while it transitions away from Europe as a gas partner? And right now, because of the high price of gas and oil, the Kremlin's coffers are foil, unemployment is low, the ruble is stronger than it was starting um, the um, uh, sanctions war, uh, back in the beginning of March, the end of February. Um, and the forecast for Russia's GDP, which had the, the Russian original forecast was for GDP to potentially drop up to 23% this year. That has been 
uh, reduced and reduced and reduced, and they're now looking at a GDP GDP drop of between two and four percent. And uh, there are many reasons uh, thus far to take a look at what is happening in Europe with the runaway inflation, mm -hmm. with the energy prices that are up to 800 percent what they were a year ago, with the potential closers of uh, mass uh, businesses, small businesses, major industries, that it is the West who will suffer worse from their sanctions war on Russia than Russia. But, but, but Mark, but long term, you know, short term, as I said, I think, you know, the Russian economy is OK. But the long term, even uh, as Russia twice to say, you know, distance itself from European market, which is the main market for Russian products and services, and turn to, say, uh, East Asia, uh, Asian countries, you know, China, India, and other Asian countries. And people would say, uh, but that probably will not uh, make up for the loss of the European market. Is there a concern about that? Um, I know a lot of people are saying that. I mean, I, but I, I think that is wishful thinking on Europeans' part, who put a little bit too much hubris um, on their uh, importance, uh, you know, uh, both to Russia and to the global economy. But I think that you know, the shift of the dynamism of the global economy, the weight of it to Asia, um, along with the increased potential to do business with Asian partners um, uh, without facing political and economic blackmail um, and uh, the increased um, energy ties uh, with Asia, you know, not just oil, uh, gas, um, um, uh, oil related products, et cetera. Um, they will all play to Russia's long term benefit. I've long argued that Russia needed to make this pivot. And I think that actually what the country should do is thank the West for forcing the Kremlin to finally come to this decision to just end relations with the West and focus on the East. And uh, Russia needs to look to the East for its future. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Andy, uh, another signal uh, uh, you know, during the speech, uh, uh, President Putin made is like, uh, you know, it is impossible to isolate Russia. All the efforts attempt to isolate Russia, I guess it's a part of the, um, the, the purpose of the sanctions on Russia, that is to isolate uh, in addition to weakening its economy. Uh, do you, you know, so far, do you think I, Russia is, is, is isolated or you know, has the, the West you know, achieved the goal of isolating Russia? Yeah. No, I think they clearly, uh, the US-led effort to isolate Russia has failed uh, pretty spectacularly. So again, if you read in the media, especially in the early days of the Ukraine conflict, it certainly seems the world was united against Russia except China. But if you actually looked at the reality, countries like India, uh, of course, countries like Iran, uh, even Southeast Asia, have uh, actually a much more neutral stance and much more pragmatic stance. So I think that certainly uh, efforts to isolate Russia have not succeeded. And I'm not so sure that uh, it's Russia's facing an either or uh, situation with regard to Europe. That today, of course, it's very challenging. But I think that if this winter uh, turns out to be a cold one, uh, this may really spark a re-evaluation in many European countries, and especially in places like Germany, uh, that do they want to sacrifice uh, the livelihood, uh, perhaps even the lives of their people to satisfy this American desire for hegemony? Um, and I think uh, it's a big question mark in my mind the other thing that's going on, too, is that Russia is uh, also adding LNG, liquefied national, uh, natural gas capability. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for this is that it may also now be able to compete with the U.S., which is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, exporter of LNG. Uh, but if you're looking at places where most of the people are in the world, uh, Europe, uh, Africa, you know, this the Eurasian landmass, uh, Russia has a huge cost advantage. So, again, you know, we in the short term, it certainly seems very bleak for uh, Russia in terms of uh, trade relations with Europe. But uh, 
Uh, pragmatism and economics usually win in the long run. I think we still have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert, uh, uh, do you see there's any chance that you know, some of the European countries may you know, be swayed because of the domestic pressure, as we have seen you know, demonstration in uh, Czech Republic or, or you know, part of, the Euro, uh, part of uh, Germany and other European countries as you know, gas prices continue to rise? And also, you know, there's a question about you know, isolating Russia. Uh, as a country, you know, in terms of Latin size, is one of the largest, and uh, and also with, uh, you know, uh, this is a massive res amount of resources, uh, rich resources, sure. and also most powerful weapons. Is it sure. possible? I think as Putin probably is right. It's just impossible to isolate a country like Russia. Right. Well, you know, we, we isolated the Russians during the Cold War, um, and I have the feeling that's where we're going. Um, particularly with, with Russia. It'll be harder for the U.S. and China to decouple, which is something we've discussed many times in this show. That's going to be very painful and will cost a lot of money, and everybody's going to be unhappy, especially the business communities in the U.S. and China. But with Russia, I think it's much easier to do that. I mean, it's not going to be easy, but it will be significantly easier than with China. And I think we're going to get there, especially if Putin stays in power. I think Putin has just become persona non grata in the West. Um, I do agree with your other guests. I do think really the big issue is the winter, right? Will European electorates stick to the policies that NATO has sort of outlined regarding Ukraine through the winter. A lot of that depends on the weather. It depends on just how much the Russians are willing to sort of also cut themselves off from revenue so far. It looks like they're willing to do that. Um, it depends if the Europeans can find alternative sources. Um, this problem has been known for a while. I mean, in the strategic literature, the idea of European sovereignty or sort of foreign policy autonomy being undercut by Russian pipelines, that's actually been a well-known issue for a long time. I remember reading about that back in graduate school. So my sense is that people at least have some idea that this has been coming. Hopefully there's some kind of plan. In practice, your guests are probably correct. There's probably no plan. And we'll see if European electorates actually vote for the populists that really want to sort of like take a more a sort of tougher line on, on Ukraine. But right now, to be fair, it's, it seems to me that European elites are actually pretty strongly behind Ukrainians on this, right? I mean, there's, not yet, there's yet to be like a major European figure at the elite level, at least, that has come other than Orban, of course, who's sort of a strange outlier. Mm -hmm. um, other than him, I mean, most of the European elites have sort of more or less swung behind this. But again, I think, as your other guests have mentioned, the real test will be the winter and just how cold it is and whether or not the, the, these fuel shortages that we keep hearing about actually uh, materialize or not. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mark, another interesting point uh, President Putin mentioned is uh, about the green uh, export. Uh, you know, in his words, uh, you know, he accused Western green importers of... Uh, outrageous cheating and claim that only two out of 87 ships went to poor countries. So most of them went to European countries. Uh, obviously, that's not, uh, you know, uh, as a plant in the deal, right? Um, well, I don't think there were any specificalities there. That is certainly the Western media tried to play up the crisis. Of course, in reality, there never was a Russian naval blockade. Russia made clear from the beginning that it was willing to allow humanitarian uh, 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 grain traffic uh, out through the, the Black Sea, and that the real obstacle was that the Kiev regime had mined themselves into their own ports, uh, particularly Odessa. Uh, but the uh, deal also uh, that was reached with the UN also included uh, uh, m much less talked about details that the West agreed uh, to loosen sanctions on Russian fertilizers uh, and its own much larger grain supply uh, uh, to uh, the third world. And they have not done so. And, and Russia is saying that perhaps the whole deal needs to be revisited. The, the fact that the West pushed hard, uh, you know, to get this deal through, and then the vast majority of the grain ships go to the West and not to Africa, despite the way that, um, you know, the Western media presented, uh, you know, the dire global food crisis situation just, you know, plays further to their um, a rather malicious duplicity uh, throughout this in, entire construct. But I, there, there's going to be a blowback to all of this. And we're looking at the, the political instability as, as winter uh, j is just beginning to set in. I mean, w the energy prices are just starting to reach consumers now. And already there is, you know, uh, the idea that, that 
no one is going to be able to pay these energy bills, particularly uh, small, medium sized businesses. And I think when it comes down to it is this entire crop of Western political elites is toxic. They are toxic both to the interests of their own people and to the global economy. And until the, the Western people rise up and get rid of their elites, I don't think that we can see any type of return to a globalization as we have known it before. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Robert, uh, you know, uh, Russia's Far East Development Minister also said, you know, his department uh, would make suggestions uh, to the Chinese side to create a free trade zone on a bold island by the name of Heixia's Island, uh, you know, li that links China and Russia. Uh, so anyway, that, that would be, I would say, supposed to be uh, you know, to play a role to boost the trade between the two countries if there is a free trade zone? Sure. I mean, again, if you're Russia and China, that's a great alternative to going through the system that we have discussed today, right? Again, it, the, the trick really is, I think, the geopolitical issues, which I think are actually substantial between China and Russia. I think those have been submerged somewhat by the Ukraine conflict, but there's sort of a lot of anxiety, particularly in Russia, that is becoming a junior partner to China, that China is substantially larger, particularly Russia's Far East is sort of underpopulated and not economically particularly well developed, certainly compared to China. And so I think on the Russian side, there's going to be some anxiety that this could lead to sort of greater Chinese economic dominance of Russian economic activity. But again, I mean, Putin's in a tight spot. He's basically sort of locked himself into this sort of long term, almost like a generational struggle with the West now. And so I think he's going to be going to the Chinese. And this is the kind of thing that I think the Russians are going to probably suggest with a lot of other partners because they're looking for economic outlet alternatives to uh, what they've done for the last 20 years, which is basically sell resources to the West. And so I think if you're China, if you're India, if you're Southeast Asia, I think the Russians are probably going to be making all sorts of these deals. And they'll probably offer them on somewhat preferential terms, too. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Andy, you know, a, a Chinese uh, official, Li Jianshu, the uh, top legislator, uh, is in the forum, uh, at the president of the forum, and also met President Putin there. Uh, so are we looking basically uh, strengthening ties between the two sides, in particular, I mean, trade and economic ties? Well, certainly. I mean, that has been the trend over the last few years. But I think there's a larger story here when we look at uh, China's relationship with Russia. And that let's not forget, this is a relationship that also has had very, very difficult moments over the past few decades. Um, but they've been able to peacefully resolve their differences. Um, and this you know, could be even a model to see how other countries can uh, resolve their differences as well. So I think that's very important. The other part of the, uh, the forum looking at uh, developing Russia's Far East is that it's not just uh, Russia and China with a free trade zone, but we have to remember too the Korean Peninsula uh, also because of political problems that are still a legacy of the American involvement, uh, that if this can be resolved, uh, this part of the world uh, could be very economically dynamic and drive a huge boost uh, to regional and global growth. Um, so it's something to keep an eye on. I think that uh, certainly, uh, I think China's attention, uh, the attention it's paying to this part of the world working with Russia certainly indicates uh, how important it is and I think the potential that's there as well. Well, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.